Yeah, that's Ben Jag, 91.5. And you're listening to Tony Graham. And today I've got Matthew Dickerson, the Mayor of Dubbo Regional Council, on the line for an interview about the standing committee meetings that have happened uh, on Thursday. And there's uh, some fairly important decisions and things that have been happening with that, which I'm sure everybody would like to know about. So, Matthew, uh, hello to you. How are you going, Tony? Good to be on Binging again. Thank you for having me on. It's always a pleasure. Now, the first thing we should talk about is the um, the structures. There were three standing committee meetings um, that uh, were basically held, and I guess the structure of it is very important because there's been some major changes there, hasn't there? Yeah, absolutely right. In the previous council, they had standing committees. The standing committees have been renamed slightly, but the concept is still the same. The big difference, though, Tony, is that traditionally in councils, standing committees are used to look at various concepts, look at various things that will go through to council, but it's a good chance to have a more open environment in terms of the discussion. So a standing committee has slightly looser rules of debate than a council meeting. So it's a good chance for councillors and the public to have a bit more to and fro, discuss things at greater length, and then not make a final decision. The committee meetings have a recommendation, not a final resolution, and that recommendation will go to a council meeting, which happens two weeks after the committee meeting, and that's when the resolution finally occurs. So it's not definite from the committee meeting until it goes to a council meeting. Once it goes to a council meeting, that's when the resolution is definite. But it's given the public and councillors that two-week breathing space to make sure everything's right. The last council, for whatever reasons they deem necessary, they actually gave the standing committees the full delegation of council wherever it was possible. And that essentially means they can do everything that council does, apart from a couple of minor technicalities, for example, hiring or firing a GM or the making of rates and charges. But essentially, every other decision that could be made by council in the last council could have been made by the standing committees. And I know I heard a fair bit of feedback from people saying they didn't know that a decision was being made because they were waiting for it to go to council. Many of the decisions that were made by the last council didn't actually go to council. They went to a standing committee. And we thought, this new council thought, that had the potential to confuse the public and also didn't give the council resolutions the same gravatus as if it went to a council meeting. So we've removed that delegation now from all the standing committees. The only thing that a standing committee can do is basically make those recommendations to a council meeting. The only one delegation that was still kept was the ability to award tenders. And the reason we kept that is because building services and building construction costs seem to be going up very quickly. So having that extra twice a meeting or twice a month opportunity to award tenders just gave the staff a bit more flexibility in that. But tenders are something that normally, there's not a, an open process in terms of public coming along with those anyway, because they're done behind closed doors to protect the tender prices that are put in by various companies. So we didn't see that as a real loss of transparency because they're done confidentially regardless. So that means that all the standing committees now you won't see resolutions of council from those. All you'll see will be recommendations to a council meeting. I think people will see that as a, a very welcome change given what's happened in the previous four years. Now, Matt, Matthew, some big things are happening with the res in Wellington and, you know, in the whole zone as well, which goes much further than Wellington. But there's a battery energy system being contemplated for Wellington. So can you fill us in on that? So we had, and this is one of the opportunities for the standing committees, we actually had a presentation. There was no resolution or recommendation. We don't actually allow, or we're not the consent authority for a large development like a battery. It's a state significant development, so the state government effectively does that. It doesn't, the decision isn't made by council, but I still think it's important for councillors to know where some of these projects are up to, and also for residents to look at the committee meetings tune into the web stream of those, for example, and see what's happening. So Mr. James North from Ampere Australia came along and gave us an introduction or a presentation in relation to the battery that will be built. And again, the approvals haven't been finalised yet, but if all things go to plan, we built, if you like, just out as you go out towards the, the Mudgee Road, where the large solar plant is there from BP, and you've got the substation across the road, just down near there will be a large battery built. Now, that'll be a, a battery that will give 
more, uh, if you like, um, evenness to the power delivery from the whole network. More than likely, it'll be some agreements between the solar panel, so BP there, and the battery, which will be run by Shell, which seems interesting that you've got two competitors in the oil space mm. that are actually teaming up yes. for renewables. But you'll see there where the battery will take some power when there's excess of power from the solar farm, and then when the solar farm needs power to go back, obviously things like nighttime or maybe the sun's not shining, then there'll be some delivery of power coming from the battery system there. The main thing we were concerned about was, well, not so much concerned, but interested, what's it going to do for employment in Wellington? What's it going to do in terms of injection into the economy? So we heard from Mr. James North that there'll be a period of construction that will be somewhere in the vicinity of 12 to 18 months. Obviously, they're still finalising all the minor details here and probably in the vicinity of 50 to 100 employees in that. So that'll be a good injection in the short term for Wellington. But again, my focus for these renewable projects is what does it do for the community, in particular from the economic side of it, long term? It's all well and good to have an extra 100 employees for 18 months, but what about long term? What does it do? And sure, there'll be one to maybe two people employed full-time on that particular project to maintain that and make sure everything's going according to plan. So not a huge injection into the economy there. But also we talked about the potential for maybe some staff from some of these organisations, lots of these developments are occurring. They've got staff employed in places like Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane now. Why couldn't those staff be employed in an office in Wellington, for example? So we put those ideas forward, but also talked about the idea of a community fund, things like wind turbines have a compulsory community fund, solar panels don't have a compulsory community fund. The particular proponents of this Ampere Australia, of this particular battery, are very keen to see some form of community fund, and I can't tell you the exact amount of that, that's up to negotiation still, but some form of community fund as well. So hopefully what we'll see out of this, Tony, short-term, good injection for employees. Long-term, we will see some extra employees, one or two, a community fund, and maybe some extra employees may be employed by the organisation overall, not specifically for this project, employed in the Wellington community. And and I think that's something that we've really got to aim for for, with all these renewables. How can we get some long-term benefits for Wellington? Well, Matthew, the battery energy system in Wellington is uh, going to be pretty interesting to watch that. But very importantly now, since you've started up the new council, you've been looking at committee structures, considered to be a really important thing for engagement or re-engagement or engagement for the first time, proper engagement between the two centres in the LGA, which is Wellington and, and, and Dubbo and all the greater areas around it. So there's some big things happening there. It's really good to see. Would you like to just explain some of those things? Yeah, sure. One of the things that I've always believed to be very important is that a council is only as good as the ears that are on council, in other words, being able to listen to the community. And it's very hard to listen to 52,000 people across the community because you just don't have enough hours in the day and time to be able to hear from those 52,000 voices. What you really want to do then is create funnels, ways for people to be able to channel or funnel their information through to council for ultimately council to make the best decision for the overall local government area. One of the ways that I've really considered to be a a great way to do that in the past has been a number of committees. And those committees have specific focal points or areas of interest or things that you get people together on, on some common ground. Unfortunately, the last council seemed to do away with many of those committees. In my experience, the old Dubbo City Council had a good range of committees, covered a range of topics there, and I really valued the information that came in from those committees. But again, last council seemed to ignore a lot of that and actually disbanded a lot of those committees. So there were very few committees. That meant there were very few opportunities for people to have their voice heard through the council. So we... uh, basically fixing that problem. It's uh, some of the things this new council seems to be doing is fixing some of the problems from the old council. And by fixing that, we basically are going through and saying, let's form a number of committees. So we had a workshop about it to go through and form those committees. Now, there's a process here, which I'll explain. So we had a workshop. We threw around a whole range of committees. What do we need? What sort of areas of focus are there in our community? And we came up with a list of those committees. Those committees were then taken to the committee meetings, the standing committee meetings that you've mentioned previously. And at that standing committee meeting, we put forward those various committees. We've actually already adjusted one of those committees in terms of the various committee structures there. And so those committees then will be recommended to council in two weeks' time. Once they go through council, 
they'll then be put out on public display because this is a new policy of council. So policies typically go on public display for council. Once they're on public display, we'll invite people to have the opportunity to make comment. Do they like those committees? What about the structure, the people on those committees, etc.? Are there other committees we've forgotten about? Are we wasting our time with certain committees? All of that information we want in feedback. Once that process closes, in other words, once the public consultation closes, it will then go back to council again for the final committee structure to be ratified, to be resolved by council. And then once we've got that final committee structure, we'll be able to advertise for expressions of interest for people to be on those committees and then start having those meetings. So it is a bit of a process, but good governance does take time, Tony. And that's the real issue here. We want to make sure there's good governance, not make quick or rush decisions and not get the right outcomes. Yeah, now I'll just list some of those committees that, uh, that's relevant to me, in particular to Wellington. So we've got the um, the Swimming Pool Working Party. Uh, we have the Livestock Market uh, Working Party. We've got Public Tree Spaces or Public Spaces Tree Committee, the Sister Cities uh, Committee, which we'll still have the Sister City relationship between Wellington and I think it's Osawano in Japan. And... There's the Wellington Town Committee, pretty important, and also the Village Committee, which will capture the area uh, of you know, Greater Wellington, plus uh, also these the villages around Greater Dubbo as well. And then we'll have a Youth Council. So there's also uh, suggestions of, or, or the possibilities of other councils being suggested, but that's pretty comprehensive, and I think that's pleasing to see, Matthew. Yeah, there were a total of 16 committees that were put forward to the committee meeting, the standing committee meeting, and you've just picked out a few of those ones there. And those are the ones probably more relevant to Wellington, for example. Yeah. So I, I think that's important. So if we go through a few of those in a little bit more detail, so you're talking about the swimming pools. There's three swimming pools in the LGA now. There's the Geary Swimming Pool, Wellington and Dubbo, obviously. And so in the past, that's been quite effective, having a committee that works with the whoever's running that, whether it be council staff, whether it be external, but working with the community to get feedback so we have some community reps on that. And all of these, the structure is a little bit different for different ones, but typically the structure will be one or more councillors will be on there. There'll be some staff, council staff on there to make sure we can take those action points forward and then a number of community members. And sometimes we'll have those community members from specific areas of the community. So, for example, the swimming pool working party would basically have some of the swimming clubs, for example, that would make sense, and just general users of the pool. There might be some people from, might be schools or people that are higher end users of the pool, but basically some users as well will be mixed in with that. And the idea there will be how do we keep developing it further? It's a good place to just start master plans or if we want indoor pools or heated pools or aquatic leisure centres, whatever it might be, the idea would be to feed it through those committees first, make sure we get these ideas, round them out a little bit, and then bring them through to council as a first stage and then continue on from there. So I think absolutely that will be a, a good committee for Wellington. The Dubbo Regional Livestock Market Advisory Committee, that's one that has been in existence for some time now. It did actually go through the last council as well. And that is a huge opportunity for the region to keep benefiting from the livestock markets. Obviously, when sales are on, there's a lot of people that travel from around the region to come to Dubbo, and that injects money into our economy. When people travel here, they might have to stay overnight, they might eat some food somewhere, they might fill up with petrol somewhere. So all of those are opportunities to make sure that we keep running those livestock markets as well as possible, because we want to keep bringing people from as far and wide as possible. Yeah, well, it's a step in the right direction, um, and I guess it's a really an important step for a new council to take into to start to engage with the community. Yeah. So I congratulate you on that. Um, certainly, sorry. Matthew, it's been and a pleasure the, talking the, to you. The, the Wellington Town Committee, I thought, was another good one that's very important. So that was one that focuses yeah. just on the things that Wellington as a township might need. And, and really, there are some parts of the community that believe that Wellington has lost their voice somewhat after the amalgamation. This is, to me, this is a bit of an opportunity to try and make sure that Wellington still has a voice. So you've got two councillors from Wellington, that's great, but it's also great to have that committee where you get some further feedback from the community to be able to feed that through to council. And then the last one I'd probably just update on is you mentioned the Villages Committee. And again, as you said, yeah, that's all the mm -hmm. villages in the LGA. That's places like Stewart Town, like Mumble, but also places that used to be in the old Dubbo LGA, places like 
Yumundri and Ballymore, and they're fairly spread out, as you can imagine. So it might be difficult for people to get to those meetings because we want representation from each of those villages. So we'll do a couple of things there. One thing, obviously, you'll have the ability to do video conference calls as those meetings. Now, some of those areas we're talking about, the internet reception may not be great. So we'll have the ability to go into those villages and do the meeting, even if you're not the meeting isn't in that village. But we're also committed, the four meetings that we'll have each year, to actually have those meetings spread amongst those villages. So you might have one meeting that might be at one extreme, maybe Eucharina sort of end of the LGA. Another meeting might be at the other extreme, maybe the Yamundri end of the LGA. So it just gives you an opportunity to sometimes have a meeting close to you, sometimes meeting a bit further away, but also using some technology to bring people in. Because we want all those voices, to, all those villages to be able to have their voices heard. I'm sure that these uh, developments will be very, very warmly received by all the villagers in the town of Wellington. It's a great step forward, Matthew. Thank you. We've been listening to the Mayor of Dubbo Regional Council, Matthew Dickerson. We we'll thank him very much for taking time out, and we look forward to many more meetings with Matthew. And you're listening to Binjang 91.5.